Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. This is Larry Lewis again on the Mentors Lounge. Today's episode is third of episode in November 2021. And I'm so excited to bring my brother, my business partner, and awesome friend, a phenomenal individual indeed, onto the Mentors Lounge today. Welcome with me, Steve. Okay, Leji, on to the mentors alone. Steve, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Dr. Louise. <laughs> nice uh, one, nice one. Yeah. So today we have Steve on the mentors lounge. People wondering who is Steve Okeleji. Okay, All right. Steve is a phenomenal individual. Someone who has braced through the storm, someone who has surmounted many a uh, hurdle in this life and is a mentor to many and he has been able to create a great value chain which a lot of us will learn from today and so without wasting much time i want steve to introduce himself who is steve okeleji can we meet you sir thank you steve okeleji <laughs> is just a farmer <laughs> That's, that's, that's the most uh, pleasant introduction I can give about myself. Um, and also an entrepreneur. That's basically what I am. When you say you're a farmer, what kind of farming are you doing? All right, so... Is it the one that they do at the backyard of the house? <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I have, I have my... You want friend. to be modest? Yeah, I have not going to be modest here today. You are going to see yeah. everything. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just a farmer. Just uh, uh, some of my friends uh, refer to me in Yoruba as Agbelasa Lasa. You know, mm. so, and I enjoy that. <laughs> mm. <laughs> All right. So, so my, my keen interest is, is into aquaculture. Right. Yeah. Okay. And so, uh, can you break it down for us? Yeah, for the benefit of those who are not familiar with that name or that term, aquaculture is a study of aquatic animals and plants in a cultured environment. That's just layman's uh, interpretation of what aquaculture is all about. Right. So my question to you today is, how did you get into this? Where did they all start from? Was it by accident or by virtue of you studying in in um, in the university of agriculture? Or how did they all start? Well, I, I used to say that um, my experience in the aquaculture industry is as old as my existence, and hmm. and this is one of the things I tell to people: uh, everything in life is all about privilege. And I want to say that I was privileged to be born by an old veterinarian father who instilled into me so early in life the discipline and the rudiments of how to actually be successful so early. So growing up back in the days in, in, in my uh, state where I grew up, my dad had a very big farm uh, and it was commercial, integrated commercial farm. Uh, where we had poultry, we had fish, we had pigs, we had goat, we had plants. Oh, no. It was um, what we call the integrated farming system. So my interest uh, initially was into dogs. I, oh. I I love dogs. I'm sure you remember. Yeah, yeah. Where we kept pit bulls and um, yeah, uh, it was always terrifying everybody and terrorizing everybody in the estate. Mm. Where lived together before you traveled yeah uh, and um, after that I had to pick up my own interest in aquaculture so it's just you know something of passion for me to mm. what fish, fishes or fish let me now say fish hatch and um, watch them grow by the day but I also didn't want to be uh, a farmer either. Mm. My dream was to become an engineer. Mm. And I tried everything. Uh, you know, 
uh, to become a mechanical engineer, but wow. it never happened. Uh, of re recently, my, my dad called me and told me, Steve, I saw one of your old books, uh, the engineering mathematics, K.A. E. Strott. K.A. E. Strott. Yeah. yeah. And, and he, started, he said, you wrote Engineer Steve. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you know, we laughed over it. I said, well, I'm still engineering fishes and water now, you know, so. And in actual fact, engineering is, is in all the departments. Sorry, in all all the professions, let me put it that way. Mm. So whatever you want to do in life, there's always a bit of engineering in it. So um, that was what informed um, me studying aquaculture because uh, I tried all that I could do to when I got to school at some point, uh, I did a pre-degree at the Federal University of Agriculture at Belputa. And I missed the cutoff of engineering with just a mark. Mm. Um, I tried everything. My second year, I thought I could still change, of course. You know, yeah. Uh, but it didn't work. And then my dad told me, he said, son, I was so disturbed. And I said, I was just, just going to abandon it. That it was, I had a slogan then, engineering on nothing. So I was so obsessed about it. So he came to me one late night and said, son, you know what, I'm your dad. Um, and I'm well experienced. And I, I cannot give you a wrong advice. Mm. Uh, I cannot go for what you know already how to do. I said, dad, what is that? He said, aquaculture, fisheries. Um, mm. Because um, you already know this from child, childhood. And um, uh, you can actually continue in this life. Mm. I felt bad about it, but I had to just think about it. And, um, you know, as God will have it, mm. I decided to uh, you know, go for that option of aquaculture and uh, wow. fish management. Yeah. And um, I never regretted it. Even, wow. when I, yeah, even when I had to go through a lot of challenges in life, mm. uh, I never regretted it. And uh, I pray that uh, I will never even have a cause to regret it because uh, I want to believe I've been through, you know, the storms, mm. the real storm. Mm. Mm. <laughs> awesome, awesome. This is this is interesting. So at the end of the day, you 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 chose a career um, reluctant. But your father served as a mentor to encourage you to follow this course. And here you are today, you have created a big value chain. Now, I may know about this thing, but I want you to share this thing. You studied aquaculture yes. at the university after failing to do engineering that you wanted to do. Yes. How did you now become an aquaculture entrepreneur. How did you transition right. from being a student of aquaculture to become an entrepreneur? Was it right from the university also, or were you finished? How did you build the system? Because this is very, very important for people. All right, so so my, my story uh, of taking uh, the tangential fully into yeah. aquaculture. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very funny story. <laughs> After the conviction of my dad, uh, I was very restless as a young child. For those mm. who knew me when I was way young, very, very restless. Mm. So I felt I could just do several things. And um, in my second year, after having a carryover mm. in mathematics, and you know, mathematics was uh, a, a compulsory subject for you to pass before you can uh you're going to swap your your course yes. for yeah for engineering, for engineering so, yeah so uh, you know <laughs> as god will have it <laughs> because i want to believe it was the finger of god you know that hmm. you know, this is my plan for you um, this is what you have for yourself i will make you fail uh mathematics and wow I failed mathematics with, you know, my mathematics was one of my uh, best uh, subjects mm -hmm. because I just wanted to become an engineer. So you must be good at you know, mathematics. 
Um, so I failed mathematics and uh, I had to resign to fate. And I said, okay, I won't go ahead with aquaculture. So in my second year, I was very, very restless upstairs. Just wanted to do something different. Hmm. Uh, and then we normally had this insistent industrial asset strike in Nigeria. Mm-hmm. And um, then you'll be left as a young chap with a lot of time to play around or to waste your time. Mm-hmm. So I said to myself, I don't want to waste my time. And part of what also informed my decision so early as a young chap was that, you see, background is everything. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I can tell you that 90% of those who have succeeded today in Nigeria, one way or the other, their background mm. has influenced their success. Mm. So growing up, I, I was privileged to be born in a family of four great men. And mm. um, my dad happened to be a reader. He has a library. And mm. uh, he made sure we always, maybe uh, it, it wasn't deliberate on his past. But my dad was someone who got a book with you and would discuss with you, make sure you read the dailies um, every Sunday, we, you know, buy the newspapers mm. and then we deliberate and discuss issues. It was, you know, that's mm. active. Yeah. Way younger than growing up. So, yeah. Reading was already part of me. Mm. And uh, part of the books I read then, um, Think and Grow Rich. Mm. Uh, by uh, Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill. Yeah, and also yeah. Power Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Norman Vincent Yeah, so those were, those were some of the books I read uh, in my formative years as mm. a young child. Mm. And that had already given me that kind of high there. And then I also read about autobiographies and biographies of great people. A young child, mm. and eighty percent of the autobiography that I read, um, I found out that my background was way better than the background of most of these great men. Mm. Their parents were farmers, peasant farmers. Some never even had parents. Some had to, you know, grow from nothing to something. And I said to myself, and these are these are not Nigerians that yeah. they, they, they didn't even have a better background. So I had no. That's no true. excuse uh, for not, you know, wanting to tow the path of success. Mm. And so in my second year, I had ample time because we had a lot of, you know, strikes. And, strike. and I said, uh, it was nice for me to just start something. And then my eldest brother then uh, was also um, doing his master's then at the Federal University of Agriculture because you know, my dad has this dream, and a long time he's been saying that the future of Nigeria uh, is in the hands of those who can run things by themselves, in the hands of the private sector. So that, that's always been in that mind. So, uh, so three of us came to the Federal University of Agriculture wow. to study agriculture, so that we can also continue for where it stopped. Uh, and then my my younger brother, uh, that you know, yeah, the doctor. Yeah. yeah. So, so he took the tangential to become uh, medical doctor. Medical doctor. Yeah. He studied medicine, mm. and he's doing so well. So, mm. um, at that point, um, I joined my brother uh, then to you know, set up a small hatchery where we're both living together. Wow. And then after that, he left uh, the university. Um, I felt. We already have this background back home, and um, it was important for for me to also continue. And I was also studying aquaculture, and I started producing fish. Mm. And suddenly, where we were living, uh, the man we were living in his house passed on. Uh, uh, I can remember his name now. Uh, mm. Pa Rosoji Shoyinka. Uh, mm. uh, then. So, okay. and then we had to lose that premises. And then we had to pack up the whole... Uh, hatchery. Yeah, hatchery. Wow. And um, there was a day I was sick. So, you know, you're asking me fundamental... Yeah, questions. yeah. 
I need to tell you how they I are milestones. Here. They are milestones in this thing. Yeah. 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 So I need to tell you how I got here. So there was a mm-hmm. day that I was sick. So I had to go to the health center in school. And then a friend of mine who was studying veterinary medicine, Dr. Jaye Jayeola, mm. I think he's in Canada, doing well for himself too. Mm. Uh, saw me and said, Steve the fish. And mm. so the doctor that I was supposed to see uh, happened to be a friend to, to, to Dr. Jaye. Yeah. And uh, he, he picked up the in, an interest in the name. Uh, I said, Steve the fish. The fish. Yeah. And then, <laughs> yeah, he said, what is it about fish? Because that was what I was known. Yeah. Popularly called at school then amongst my friends. And then and I told him that I, I, I was studying aquaculture and that uh, I have a small archery that's packed up. And then he said, oh, he also has a farm somewhere in town that he was trying to set up. And But uh, he has no time. And then the guy who was supposed to also manage it wasn't also very committed to it. Yeah. So that way. Uh, but you know, then we had put away the structure. Yeah. So, but I was, because I was very restless and we had this ASU strike. So I went up to meet this man mm. and uh, Dr. Adewi. Yeah, that mm. was his name, Dr. Peter Adewi. Mm. Dr. Peter Adewi, I will forever be thankful to him because wow. he was very magnanimous. Yeah, he was very magnanimous. So I told him, I said, sir, can I see that farm? Uh, or that, can I see that land you were proposing to start uh, the fish farm on? The fish farm. So, yeah. So he said, yeah, why not? So when they're together, I saw a very big concrete tank uh, that was already cracked. Mm. And I said, I, I wouldn't mind if you could just give me a portion to lease. And uh, mm. he said, why not? That since I'm not using it. So he gave me the portion. And mm. uh, I started, you know, replicating the same old system we abandoned oh. there. Wow. And that was the really second semester of my second year in the university. So wow. when I got to my third year, um, Dr. Dewey, you know, came up to me and told me, Steve, uh, I actually got some funds from a microfinance bank and I want to pay back the microfinance bank since I have no more run in the farm. That was what he said. Then I said, sir, I put in some little money here. I'm interested in buying this property. If I don't have the cash, what can you do for me? And that was why I said, I would never forget it. Forget it. I'm a great man. Yeah. Hmm. And then he said, Steve, you know what I'm going to do for you? Because I can see that you are young, energetic, wow. and very dynamic. I will introduce you to the bank manager of the microfinance bank. And to call the long story short, he did introduce me. Wow. And he told the finance bank that this guy is a student. Uh, he doesn't have all the money, but he will pay in installments. Mm. Would you allow to pay in installments? The man said yes. So I started paying in installments. Wow. Was in 2006, the property was sold for 450000 naira in 2006. Yeah. Right? So I should go then, yeah. So I started paying in installments. And uh, yeah, a part of that story, in between when I met Dr. Adewi, because we have, I had already put away the structure, the old structure. Uh-huh. And uh, in between when I decided to meet Dr. Adewi and uh, when I got that farm, yeah. my lecturers, some of them went to the practice of aquaculture. Those of them that were studying I'm sorry, teaching us aquaculture to in school. Yeah. And, and one that is still very alive and has so much respect um, is Professor Gieno Heziri. Uh. So I walked up to him. I said, Papa, I have market of fish in the north. Because during this long strike, yeah. I had to travel to the north to um, do. So I pretended I was a final year student trying to you know, administer questionnaires and ask questions. So I went straight to the Ministry of Agric in the North, in Kano precisely. I saw, I was able to meet the Agric officer in charge. And um, 
I introduced myself to him as a student of the Fair University of my culture and I had the questionnaire. So he was excited. So the questionnaire, the way I drafted the questionnaire, I knew they had a problem in the north of producing fish because of the weather and the mm. skills that they really didn't also have enough of that. Mm. So um, at that point, the, the man obliged me and introduced me to quite a number of farmers that I was wow. able to ask. And these farmers happen to be big scale farmers. Wow. So part of the questionnaires was to capture their needs and they were so excited. And I told them I can always give them the kind of size of fish, uh, which was uh, what we used to, oh, sorry, which is what we used to call the juvenile fish, mm. uh, 10 grams fish uh, then. So, and you know, as God we have it, I wasn't producing then. I got back to the Southwest. I met with our Professor Gian Wizzeri. And as to strike, there was no money being paid to our professors, uh, to our lecturers, you know, generally. <laughs> Baba had a lot of fish. And he said, Steve, are you sure? You know, he has this. Yes. Has... <laughs> so he said, Steve, are you sure I'm you sure. are going to be able to sell this fish? I said, yeah, Dad, I will. Uh, give, me, give me a chance. So he said, but you have to pay some money. I was able to look for very, very small money. I can't even remember how much. But that money was insignificant. But mm. he knows that guy is my student. So Baba was magnanimous again, uh, professor. Mm. Gave me 20,000 pounds of fish. And that was why I started trading in the north. And I was wow. making a clear for 10 naira per fish. So wow. by the time I got to my third year, I was able to pay off fully. Uh, the money of, yeah. Wow. And um, that was how I started fully in my toy. Mm. And I was still buying. So I had a, I had a triangular lifestyle. Yeah, I was mm. a little bit of uh, a churchy guy then. So mm. I was always going to fellowships. So my, my, it was a tangential for me. Um, I, you know, you go to the farm, to school and to fellowship. Mm. All right, that was the kind of lifestyle I was uh, mm. living there. So wake up very early in the morning. I go to my farm very early. Mm. Walk on the farm by ten o'clock. Lectures are always, you know, by nine. You start mm. lecture at nine, but most times I was, I was always very late for lectures. But I always catch up. I had friends, two friends, uh, the Doctor Dejadioye and uh, Nathaniel. These guys were first class materials. They, they actually graduated top notch mm. uh, uh, from from the college. They, they, they yeah. played with the um, uh, a record there when, when we left school. So I was always getting their notes, photocopy their notes to read and to also sit with them to also catch up. And so mm. that was how I was able to combine um, studying, study and practicing uh, aquaculture while wow. I was in school. Wow, 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 man, this is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> wow, you know, I'm, I say something here, <clears throat> yeah. which is very important for young people today. I, I can see drive, I can see focus, I can see determination to explore. You had the hatchery. By benevolence, you are connected to that doctor. And you took the courage. I mean, if someone the courage to approach him and say that, Sir, I think I want to lease that place. Yeah. And there's something they call validation. The reason why he was able to go ahead and stand for you and say that this person, let him have access to this loan, he can pay back. It's because he has seen some traction. He has seen some level of diligence. Now, yeah. people, these are basic principles that you are applying and anybody that sees some things, we see that, you no. Know, um, you know, there's this saying that says that um, a child that is going to be exceptional when he mm -hmm. grows up, right? 
is yeah. going to be very remarkable right from the young age. That is, if the child is going to be sharp when it grows up, it's going to show some tendencies of being sharp right from the young age. So someone of, I mean, of the statues of that doctor saw all that. And that is why even the professor was able to do that. And like you said from the beginning, background. Now, I've heard stories of people who went into aquaculture and got their fingers burnt. In fact, some people ran away totally from the business. <laughs> That's true. And the aquaculture business has a very massive value chain. Um, there is a uh, hatchery, there is the harvesting, there is the selling, there is the um, processing. There is also the capacity development, which is the training aspect. It's ma really massive. Yeah. Now, my next question is, have you got your fingers burnt in this process before? <laughs> if you have got your fingers burnt, my what were the mistakes? How did you overcome it? <laughs> because to hell. they say that fail <laughs> quickly. Back. Yeah. Fail yeah. quickly in yeah. order to be successful. Yeah, so can yeah. you share some of these things with us? I mean, I mean, how, how, why, why, why have you burnt your fingers in the process? Yeah, yeah, I have burnt my fingers many times, and wow. and, and 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 I have this uh, this. Uh, I'm trying to use the look for the right uh, the right word, right word now. But I have this saying mm. that it is okay to be young and stupid. But it is disastrous to be old and foolish. Mm. So, and so early in life, because I was very, very restless, mm. I, 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 that's my background again, helped me. Mm. I brainstormed very well. So, mm. because I do a lot of that as a young child. I, you have the tendency to do quite a number of things. Uh -huh. Some uh -huh. I fail, some I, 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 you know, scale through and yeah. But I got my fingers burnt uh -huh. when I was way younger. Uh -huh. So that was why I said it is okay to be young and stupid uh -huh. than to be old and foolish. And foolish. So I, I, I learned the ropes making terrible mistakes when I was way younger. Mm. And I'll tell you Phew. the other side of it here mm. later. You see, again, I want to say to people who might be watching or listening to this later that you only shortcut in life. Mm. A shortcut in life that exists in life is you finding a right mentor so early in life. Mm. What will a mentor do or a role model? Whatever, I want to use the word the mentor now because yeah. it's a mentor's lunch. So mm. uh, it's very you know ideal for me to use the word yeah. um, a mentorship now. So the, the, the only shortcut that exists is when you find somebody who is able to steer you away from an impending doom, failure. Disaster, yeah. And so I was very, very fortunate as a young child to have my father as my first mentor. Mm. And I also was able to have very elderly folks around me mm. who I could run to and upon whose shoulders over years I've also shared a lot of vicissitudes, you know. Mm. Um, so, mm. Yeah, and so it is it is normal for you to set out so early in you know in life to say you want to achieve because uh, you are young, you are energetic, it is normal for you to say you have a lot of dreams you want to um, achieve. 
But the day you make that determination, there's a contrary force that will suppress you. In it again, you will also have to make some mistakes, to learn some lessons, to cut your teeth. Uh, I made fundamental mistakes and decisions while, while, while starting out. Mm. But the one that kept me down most was a situation in the industry that a lot of people still grapple with today. And that was why mm. we also decided to set up a capacity development center to build the capacity of people so that mm. we can help Nigerians and, and help Africans mm. not to just grapple in the dark. Mm. You see, in this field of aquaculture, God has helped us to reinvent it the way it mm. should be. And I'm thankful to God that God had to allow me to go through some of these challenges. And today, when I talk to people, when I want to mentor young folks and talk to them and advise them, I'm always mm. interested in their failures. Mm. Because I use, I use my as an example. If I had never failed in several multiple ways consistently, mm. for more than 20 years in this field, mm. I wouldn't have been here today. So I'm thankful yeah. to God for bringing those challenges that mm. we call failures my way. Mm. We used to have a situation on the farm at, at a point in time. I'm going to tell you the life story again today. Yeah. It was a parasite infestation problem with the catfish. Wow. And I never knew. Yes, we were taught parasites in school. We were taught bacteria. We were taught a lot of things that would affect your fish. But I didn't use my eyes to see any parasite and I didn't even see, get to know uh, the way the parasites will infest the fish. Infest. So initially, when you spawn, spawning is the time we use in the farm when you produce your fish, when, when you hatch them. Mm. The fishes will come out very well and they keep growing well. And it gets to a point in time, in about six weeks, they just start dying. And when, you are, when the fishes get to six weeks, you are just close to selling. In about eight mm -hmm. weeks, you should start selling and making money. So my story was, you know, when I started expanding, I needed to get funds from family and friends, some from banks. So about the time the fishes were getting to a point where I could sell, I just keep noticing that they just keep dying. So wow. I, was, I was caught up in a vicious cycle. We borrowed money from Mr. A, and you promised the time to pay back. About the time you were about to sell, the fish keeps dying. The fish dying. Yeah, yeah, the fish keep dying. And um, that means you are not having money to pay back. Yeah. So you have to pay to to again to get money. And you know, became, Mr. yeah, to give Mr. Hay and to also keep some to produce. And unfortunately, we do not have enough support structure in Nigeria. The insurance weren't helpful. The knowledge gap was missing. Oh, sorry, uh -huh. the knowledge, brother, was a gap. You know, uh -huh. uh, we, we didn't have enough knowledge. So there's, there's, there's a huge knowledge gap. At some point, I had to go back to school to even ask some of my lecturers there, can you please provide solutions to some of these challenges? The solutions were in forthcoming even from them. And so I had to grapple on that for a, long, a, a, a lot of time, a lot of years, keep failing, trying and error. But the beauty of it was that I was documenting my failures. Mm. Documenting my failures. I was mm. never too hurry to document those failures, right? So, so, uh, so I had a lot of stories wow. uh, that went bad. A lot of experiences. Let me say that that uh, uh, they were very gory, you know, trying to come up. But I thank mm. God they, they look so insurmountable. But today, to the glory of God, I think we've gone past that. Awesome, awesome, <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Mine. Now, um, you see, this life, <laughs> I have my own share of several <clears throat> bony my fingers, right? And I can say that um, they are the ingredients that one needs to move to the next level. Yeah. And when they talk about someone being experienced, being vast, it's because he has seen so many things right and so it helps you 
uh, to navigate life and avoid some things. Now, you mentioned elderly folks, right? You mentioned elderly folks. The elderly folks are people that you don't really, you don't, um, how will I put it this now? It's not easy for you to have access to elderly folks without fulfilling some requirements. Yeah. Um, I'm the first of um, I'm the first child. I'm also the first grandchild of my maternal grandfather. When I was young, I grew a relationship with him. Mm. I think those, those are some of the things that defined um, me having elderly friends in my life now. Yeah. Because I had a relationship with someone that was a grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> so I understand when you say elderly folks. Yeah. I understand the impact they can have in the life of a young person. How did you build this? Because for the people listening to this, Steve is somebody that has a lot of highly influential elderly folks in his network. I said, I'm going to ask you this question. How did you build relationship with people that are old enough to be, a grand, to be grandfathers to you, people that are old enough to be uncles to you, right? How did you build this relationship? People are old enough to be fathers. That they, I mean, I can say, I know, I know uh, the late uh, Admiral uh, Olumide, yeah? Olumide, Baba, yeah. Yeah. Baba took you as a, as a son, yeah. right? Yeah. How did you build this thing? How did you start? Let's, let's, hear, let's learn that also from you today. Well, so, so uh, <laughs> as, a young, as a young child, I stayed around my dad. Okay. A lot. I used to be around him. And I used to listen to him. Uh, most of his friends were way, way older than him, too. Hmm. And um, I love listening to his success story and how, you know. He also left his own father's house at the age of 17 and came to Lagos to hustle. And um, he used to say he was a self-made man. And he has a lot of experiences. So I also made up my mind that for me to also become great in life, I need all these old folks around me to be able to show me the way. I wasn't saying I wasn't afraid at some point to say that, yeah, mistakes would be made. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I also learned from my dad, my dad is a fearless man, very, very mm -hmm. fearless man. Mm -hmm. Very, very fearless man. And I saw the way you negotiated as a reader, you know, mm -hmm. uh, have the information that all mm -hmm. didn't have. Mm -hmm. So he was my number one mentor. Mm -hmm. while and he's still my mentor. You know? mm. I have a lot of mentors today. Uh, yeah. So I used to say to some people, I say, well, I have, when I want to be a good father, a good daddy in the house, um, my dad is my number one mentor. If I want to mm. be a, a real uh, man of God, mm. uh, a humble man of God, my mm. dad, you know, uh, <laughs> I have to be my mentor. <laughs> and if I want to be a, a top leader, I also have a mentor for that. <laughs> if I want to be a no-nonsense leader, I also have a mentor for that. So I, I, yeah. So, you know, I decided to have these mentors for different purposes. So that, because I know these situations will always change by time. And so I need to always put myself in their position. I need to always imagine they handling that situation. So what I do immediately, if, for example, if so 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 had to be in this situation, how will he handle it? Uh -huh. And because I have 
very good relationship with these old folks. It's always easy for me. In fact, most people don't even know that I'm way younger than my age. A lot of yeah. people think I'm very old. Yeah, and because I'm of the kind of people I'm, you I'm go sure, with. I'm, I'm sure a lot of people will be surprised by the time they get to know my age. <laughs> You know, so but you know, but I enjoy it because it's all about brain yeah. power. Yeah. It's all about brain power. So yeah. and I got that box so early in life to use this. Mm -hmm. Use this all the time. Yeah. So getting along with these old folks uh was easy for me because I understand the principles. You want to see you being very hardworking, mm -hmm. you want to see you being very honest. I want to see you being dedicated. Those three things are very important. Hard work, honesty, dedication, commitment. All right? So as a young child, these are, you know, basic ingredients that I, I had to imbibe and I, I lived by it. So, you know, like you rightly said, that's Omode Toba Mwongwe, Agbagba Jem. Yeah. If a young child knows how to wash his his hand, he will be able to eat with elderly folks. So yeah. and his elderly folks immediately they are able to identify these qualities in me and they just see me as a young child and they just keep encouraging me. My godfather of blessed memory, oh. um, late Rear Admiral Olufemi Olumide, oh. played a very, very, very important, you know, role in my uh, success in life. Mm. I would forever miss him. In actual fact, there's no day I don't think about him because this was a quintessential old man that was different. How and did your parts meet? Matter. Say that again. How did your parts meet? <laughs> oh, uh, because Baba is a grandfather. A lot of stories to be told today. <laughs> Baba is a grandfather. Okay, so let me how, tell you how we met. Let me tell you how we met. Yeah. Before I got married, yeah, I used to leave my farm late in the evening. Mm. Normally, you'll be tired. Yeah. So I have a small spot where I used to eat in town called Wendy Suits those days in Abel Kuta. <clears throat> I always retire to Wendy Suits to eat my food, my dinner. And then I used to see this old man sit alone by his bottle of star, <clears throat> drinking. <clears throat> Did I tell you some Did I join the club? 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 Because I like daring. Mm. Number one rule, if you want to become great in life, you must be fearless. Yes. You must be courageous. Nobody mm. will teach you this in school. Mm -hmm. not... Yeah. I've never seen the course where they say uh, courage. You must learn how to be courageous. So, mm. <laughs> so I said, there must be something about this old man. I walked up to him and I introduced myself to him. And I'm Steve Okeleji, I'm a farmer. And um, so imagine me introducing myself to you. And um, after introducing myself to you, and you just keep looking at me this way you are looking at me and not responding. Wow. <laughs> you are know just looking at me. I said, what kind of a man is this? And the next thing he said, he said, congratulations. <laughs> I said, so I asked myself, how, how, what is the link between my introduction and, and congratulations? congratulations. And then he went into his own 
um, story telling mm. me how he also took a tangential into farming and we got, that was how we met the first time wow and because i know there's there was a lot for me to learn from an old man like that yeah. an old wise man yes i didn't even know then that he was a former minister for for works former mm. minister for, for uh, uh transportation at some point mm -hmm. I so we got along and later he began to tell me and he was watching me he later introduced me to his family mm. and then we bonded mm. we bonded and then mm. he told my dad about him he met my parents uh in wow. fact baba olumide was his birthday was april 6 my dad's birthday is april 7. wow so and we had a lot of things in common wow and as god will have it again my wife that i married mm -hmm. Baba Olumide, coincidentally was the chairman of my own parents in-laws wedding oh, <laughs> oh. that's interesting and he never had any hand in introducing us you know wow so so for me i believe in the divine plan of divine. god yes yes there's always a divine arrangement orchestration you awesome and so this that was our wonderful. Thing. wow yeah. this is wonderful <laughs> this is wonderful wow <laughs> now you see um the beauty of the mentors lounge is that we're trying to bring people to share not only their stories but the principles yeah. the patterns the things that they have incorporated into their life that is making them to do what they are doing today yeah. so now you've you've gone through raising um the bar in aquaculture i know you launched the aquatic hub couple of years ago yeah <laughs> now the aquatic hub today i know partners with several states yeah. how did you break this threshold to to evolve from someone who was doing the normal thing that people do like you you hatch and you sell you now building capacity in people taking the experience of everything that you have gone through you've got in your hands that how did you transition to someone that is now training having an institution a vocational institution training people the practicals everything how how did this thing happen hmm. aquatic cop didn't also come easy in 2016 i was frustrated Huh. I was frustrated not because we weren't producing fish, we were producing enough fish, but I was always being confronted with two major challenges. Energy, that's electricity. In the last um, 15 years of running my farm in Abeokuta, I've used 46 generators. That was a major challenge. The other challenge, was the lack of getting good technical staff. Mm. And that was what gave back to Aquatic Hub. Mm. Each time we employ young chaps, and I used to say this, that the fact that you are a graduate of anything in the university doesn't make you an authority. Mm. You must apply yourself to walk the walk. And it also mm -hmm. goes with a long time saying that um, knowledge is not power. A lot of people say knowledge is power. No, knowledge is not power. Applied knowledge is mm. power. Yeah. Knowledge in itself, in its form, is static. Mm. Because it can it be is useless. When you, it is when you apply it that yeah. it becomes power. Yeah. Applied knowledge is the real power. So when people say knowledge is power now, you can get the knowledge. Quite a number of my colleagues got the knowledge, the same knowledge I got in school, 
many of them have applied it. Yes. So for those of us who applied it, then we became powerful. Mm. So it's just as easy as that. And so when we employ these young dudes, I discover that they're always as empty, my expression again, they're always as empty as an empty can. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I have very funny expressions. <laughs> And so when you now put something into them, you know, and and they learn, the next thing they do is they just leave at the point at which you, you begin to feel you've started attaining some form of stability. Yeah. They leave to start their own thing. You see, I don't have a problem about impacting in people uh, because the more people you impact, the more, the better, the, the better life becomes too. Yeah. Right? So I do not, I do not have, uh, a problem with impacting in people yes. really uh but i have a problem with people who distort your plans I'm sorry i just want to mute my phone yes uh, no problem yeah people would disturb your plan because what i was always going through then was always a form of uh don't mind you train this dude, you spend a lot of resources on him while training him. You keep making losses. He keeps learning on you in the expensive way, mm. losing money and resources. And we believe that one day we'll get to know it. You overlook a lot of shit. And at the end of the day, he learns to some extent. And then he takes, he jumps Take off. Clip. And then you have to start the game from square one. And so that frustration came in. What kind of a country is this? Mm. So I made up my mind I was going to leave Nigeria. Wow. Uh, I told my wife. Uh, she, she didn't say anything. I told my mom. Sweet mom. No, I told my dad first. My dad, father said, son, hmm, why can't you just stoop to conquer? That was his word. Hmm? The dad, I've been going through a lot of this. And you know, sometimes you build me house when I'm broke. I, sometimes I don't. The last time I got funds from my dad was, and I must say this, was when I was in my second year. I started paying my school fees for my third year. Mm. Because I started making money. I just told him that you don't have to bother. Mm. And that was the last time I got money. So, But when I now started expanding, and sometimes I run into big problems, mm. I will always call him once in a while to say that, you know what, the boy's down. The boy's down. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then you understand when I say because you have to also be a veteran in the field. Yeah. Call. So you understand. So, you know. And I said that you've rescued me many times. <laughs> and I'm tired, I'm sick and tired of Nigeria. And huh. I have to My father said something in Yoruba. He said, Toba Ah. Mm. That was, you know, it was like a big, like if you go, you come back to Q at the back Q, of the yeah. I've left. <sighs> then I called my mom and I said, Mom, this is my plan and I have to leave. I made up my mind. I said, What did your father say? My, my mom said, What did your father say? I said, uh, said I said, it's a bad luck. I said, Whatever your father has said is what I have said to you. Wow. And I need a validation of two of them. My wife also said no. Ah, I said this people don't know what's up. I mean, they wear the shoe, man. I got bills on my neck, and you know, so I started brainstorming that. Okay, what can I do? And I'm someone who enjoys solitude. I'm someone who enjoys, someone who enjoys, you know, <laughs> staying alone because it avails me the opportunity to think, think, think. And to solve very complex problems. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I started thinking, I just entered into that mode. So that's, you know, <laughs> quiet mode. Mm -hmm. To connect with my source and to also get the inspiration. Yeah. And um, I was able to get the inspiration to say where is where you you've seen as the problem is where the solution is. So that means that. This opportunity of lack of good skilled technical staff. Uh, it's, a, you, it's a gap. Yeah, it's a gap that you must fill, and that people must begin to pay for for knowledge. Why can't you set up 
a center where you can now put all this knowledge you've gathered over the years, put it into them. So I got that and then I started walking towards that. And then, you know, spoke to a few friends uh, who also, you know, they're very, very supportive. And I said, friends, you know what? This is my plan. I don't have enough funds. Can you support? Sold a few properties, put the funds together. And I made a vow. I said, this now, I don't have the support, the validation, support of my parents. I don't have that of my, you know, wife because she was uh, very, we were, we were both young in marriage then. So mm. I was doing a good guy to always listen to my wife's advice. You know, they used to tell us that you have to listen to your wife. You have to. Mm -hmm. I said, all right, I'll listen to you on this. And um, I made a vow. I said, this will be my last investment in Nigeria. Mm. And if I fail, I will not even call any one of them to notify them when I leave Nigeria. I would just travel normally like uh, my normal business schedule travel. Yes. Passport, just jot out of the country. And I made up my mind that the only thing that will ever bring me back when I get out of the country is, well, I know when I leave, my wife will have to join me. She has no choice, except yeah. if she wants to leave without me. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have kids there. So, 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 so I was ready to set up you know, uh, that kind of uh, strategy for me to mm. just jot out of the country. Yeah. I said, the only thing that will ever make me come back is, will be uh, whenever my parents pass on and I come back to just give my last respect to them. And I was that bitter about They are determined. Yeah, and that determined and, and, and that bitter about Nigeria because Nigeria happened to me several times. You know, to be failing consistently for over 20 years on a course mm -hmm. and this failure are not necessarily your own fault your fault environmental problems systemic, systemic problems, problems. Mm. that you don't have a control over there was a year at this same 2016 no a year before that the 2015 that led into 2016 mm. we had um uh, this fuel scarcity. I couldn't get fuel on the farms. I couldn't get fuel. After producing fishes that could fetch you about five million naira, then mm. Mm. because you couldn't get fuel, all the fishes died because you did you dare not leave water for twenty four hours without changing your water Hi. in the farm. So an intensive system of aquaculture. Wow. I lost it. How is that my fault? Have I not wow. put in my best? Wow. I went ahead. I also put solar on my farm. I spent about then in 2011, mm. then in 2011, about seven million era on investment of solar on my farm that lasted for a few years, about a year. It packed up just because. I needed a minimum of about 240,000 of 240,000 liters of water every day. So, so, so I I really feel for young Nigerians really who are really struggling and trying. Mm. I, I would never blame any Nigerian who decides to leave Nigeria because mm. there's a limit to which you can take it. You can't take. So if I never had the kind of background and support I had. I would have left a long time ago. Four of my friends mm. that we graduated together later joined the US Army. Mm. And I also had the opportunity. Mm. Mm. And I, but I was very dedicated. I said, no, very patriotic. No, Nigeria, no, you know, this kind of Nigeria go better yes. thing. And that, you know, was, you know, right in my Mandula Blangata to say, man, yes. you know, Nigeria, nothing. So I was that patriotic. And I am still patriotic. Because, you know, after crossing that phase, mm. <laughs> the next thing is you want to look back and see how many battles you've won. Man. Mm. I have another friend, you know, who used to motivate me. He would say, Steve, <laughs> you have seen 17. What is 12? They only look alike. <laughs> <laughs> 
you know? <laughs> you know? So that's funny. So, so you know, each time, each, those days when I when I used to, you know, you know, go to him and uh, man, I'm tired. I'm just say, Steve, come on, what is wrong with you? You've seen seventeen. What is twelve? They only look alike. <laughs> you know, so so you know that that was enough motivation for me. So I was just wow. going on pain again. So. Wow. Breaking those barriers, mm -hmm. you must be resilient. Mm. And you must also harm yourself with knowledge. Mm. Knowledge. And apply that knowledge. Mm. Because, you know, those were things that really helped me. Mm. Mm. Apply mm. that knowledge. Mm. <laughs> Honestly, this is, this is massive. This is massive, Steve. I mean, I... I'm looking at the hour, and it looks like if we're almost one one hour already on this on this on this call, and um, <laughs> I'm like, wow, this is awesome. Maybe I'll just ask you two more questions so yeah. that I don't take too much of your time this evening. It's fine. It's fine. Uh, now the thing is this: um, I want you to share, and I want you to have this at the back of your mind when you're sharing this. What are the things that young people need to do, right? to develop relationship with the older generation who can vouch for them and open the door for them to enter some places. I know you very well. By virtue of your relationships, you have relationship with people that are, they can speak for you in your absence. We don't need to mention, I don't need to mention names here, but I know them. Very high person <clears throat> that everybody knows in this not only in Nigeria. <laughs> if that kind of person, if, if that person calls anybody in the country, they will open the door for you. But in the generation of younger ones today, like Sorosoke generation, I'm not saying people should not Sorosoke, but that is what they call wisdom, being wise, being strategic. Because in your Sorosoke, you have to Sorosoke with sense. Because you are you are you are speaking up because you want to make impact now if you're speaking up does not make impact what is it going to be so it's going to be a a, a combination a hybrid of speaking and also being wise in your engagements so what can you advise based on your own experience how do you navigate this as a young person well, yeah. young fellas must accept the state at which they are, knowing that that state is a bad state. You must, first of all, do what I call self-realization. Number two, they must be willing to want to improve on that state, that status quo that they are. Number three, they must be very, very humble enough to learn. Mm. Number four, they must have been able to work on themselves on issue of honesty. That is the icing on the cake. Transparency. Mm. I, I used to tell people, say, even if you're going to kill me, I'm going to tell you the truth, man. I don't care who you are. Mm. Because as a child, my father used to tell me, the truth itself is a weapon. If you know mm. how to use it, you'll be as bold as a lion. Don't you mm. want to be as bold as a lion, boy? You know, that, those are the kind of things they used to put in my head. Mm. And so, when you tell the truth, and when people know that you are honest to a fault, mm. brutally, brutally honest, some will like you for that. Mm. Some will hate you for that. But it doesn't care who hates you. Mm. As long as you are always honest. You see, when these old folks know that you have all this composition and you are hardworking, honestly committed to your cause, mm. they will open up and impact and replace, you know, uh, they kind of put a bit of themselves in you. And that's what I've enjoyed over time. That is what I've enjoyed over time. These principles are 
learned, deliberately taught, and mm-hmm. right. Mm-hmm. Must be conscious of this. Yeah. You must live by it. Mm. You must be deliberate about it. Yeah, no printer is about it. You must practice it. Mm. So for me, I think that's that's one. And ultimately, mm. ultimately, mm. most important of all of this is in all of your efforts, recognizing the God factor. Mm. You see, that you cannot do anything. Yeah. I don't care what kind of religion you. I'm not a religious person. Mm. I am a Christian. Mm. But I'm not a dogmatic person mm. when, it, when it comes to doctrines. Yeah. I live by principles. Yes. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, and you must always stick to your principles. I'm not saying people should not be flexible. Yeah, you must be flexible sometimes. Mm-hmm. When you have all these principles that I've mentioned, they will work for you. And ultimately, commit your ways into God's hands as a Christian. Mm-hmm. Uh, know that you are also a fantastic Christian. Uh, <laughs> always commit your ways into God's hands. And mm-hmm. I also want to drop this. That's, mm-hmm. you know, while doing things when I was young, I could do a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, somehow, you know, scale through some amount, scale through. But as I began to grow old, and I began to also get the knowledge of life, the smallest thing I commit into God's hands, a small hands, asking God to give me a right guy in my gate to open my gate. Mm-hmm. You, also see that you can always walk up to uh, a security company and apply now. For me, before I do a thing, I don't have to go to a pastor. I don't go to pastors. I don't even believe in that. Mm. But I believe you can commune with God. Yeah. Directly. Yeah. I I don't go to pastors. I don't. I don't even bow yeah. for it. to bow. No, not not like a form of respect. But I mean, I don't bow to pastors to pray for me. I don't do that. The only person I bow to is my God. And so, I, so and I believe it's not that I don't respect pastors. I respect them, mm. but I don't let anybody stand in my way of communication to God. Yeah, yeah. No, nobody yeah. wants to accept Christ. Yeah, yeah. That's the mediator that I've got. Yes, yeah. And so, for young fellas, you must always commit your ways into God's hands. You might look so small. It works. Yeah. Oh, that struggles. Yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is wonderful. <laughs> this is wonderful. Steve O. Yeah. <laughs> this has been an explosive session indeed on, on the Mentors Lounge. I mean, I must, I must really appreciate you for this time and uh, sharing these deep background insights, you know. Um, the last question I'm asking you this evening is this. Going forward, right? What is the future of aquaculture value chain in Nigeria? I'm asking this question because there was, um, I think it was 2018, right? I was invited to be a keynote speaker at an event at the Taishana University of Education. And in preparing for that keynote, I discovered something that was mind blowing to me that we still spend close to Mm, I think about about two point something billion dollars on importation of fish. About one hundred billion dollars. So about one hundred four billion dollars. So I ask myself, I ask myself, why, why is this? With all everyone saying that I have fish pond, I have this, I have that. Why is this happening? What can it what so what's the future of aquaculture? Why can't we meet that demand? Because if 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 such billions of dollars is spent to bring stuff in, then there is a lot to be made if that could be created within, especially for the African continent. Yeah, so that's my last uh, shot to you this this day. 
you have asked a very, very important question. And part of the reason why someone like me is still in Nigeria. You see, Nigeria is a very beautiful country. Mm. It's a lot of potentials. But these potentials are untapped. The space of aquaculture where we play today mm. is highly untapped. Highly. Highly untapped. In other clans, they are talking about the blue revolution. In Nigeria, we're still grappling with just catfish, tilapia. Mm -hmm. The fish demand in this country, now, we don't have right statistics in this country, but the one we did in our part, right? mm -hmm. we've discovered that the fish demand in Nigeria, as we speak, is roughly about 4.2 million metric tons. 4.2 million metric tons. And we as a nation, we are struggling to just provide just about, now a lot of people going into it and the research we've made, maybe about 2 million metric tons now. Wow. So there's a gap of about 2.2 million metric tons. And that's where the money is in a population of people that are more than 200 million. Hmm. FAO says the standard that you should consume per head, per capita, is about 13 kg. And we are struggling as a nation. Sorry, it's about 21 kg rather. And we are hmm. struggling as a nation to consume between 11 to 13 kg per capita in a year. So we are still below. Oh. Standard. So, going to your question and answering your question, oh. the aquaculture world is the boss world. And our, part of our conviction in aquatic world is that we believe we can never break the shackles of poverty without building the capacity of the key players. You oh. agree with me that you cannot upscale tradition. Yeah. There are traditional ways of doing things, and they remain traditional. This one is, it can, can and if you want exponential growth, you have to change. You have to change. There must be a distortion. Mm. Something must come and disrupt the normal. Yes. And that's what we've been able to identify to in Aquatic Corp to say, see, our eyes on it. We have a hands on to the value, the entire value chain. Mm -hmm. And we have been able to take on the entire value chain of aquaculture. The one that we are left with is marine culture. And we're going to get there in the next few years. And, and, and that's part of why we're also building the capacity of people and say, see, you know what? This is how to go about it. We started a program recently called Neighborhood Impact Program. It was to encourage people to begin to grow their own homegrown fish within the premises where they live. So the neighborhood impact program is not even with our foundation, Blue Echo Foundation, it's not even just talking of aquaculture alone. It's all about you doing urban farming. Mm -hmm. What you hear today, why are we all sick in Nigeria? We are sick because our animals are sick and our plants are sick. If you want to prove me wrong, anytime you come back to Nigeria, sir, mm -hmm. hmm, you go yes. to, to any pharmaceutical shop in the evening, you need to see the numbers of people queuing to get medication. To get drugs. In the morning, go to veterinary shops in the morning. You need to see the numbers of people, farmers, also keen to buy medications for their animals. And so if we do not address it, we will all perish. It's just a matter of time. Because we are what we eat. Yeah. And, and I'm so passionate about this. Part of why someone like me who put Nigeria first above any nation, no matter. Yeah, Nigeria has happened to me. If I have yeah. to go into, you know, much of this story, yeah, the time of course. Me, yes. Some of this, you know, for me to have, you know, two times in my life attempted suicide. Mm. When everything was lost. Yeah. And I have to bounce back from square one as a young man. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Nigeria has happened to me, but I'm still here still trying to show others the way not to fall into those pitfalls. So the future of aquaculture in Nigeria is on scratch and is untapped. 
Uh, more we get people, and that's why we're trying to do a lot of programs with developmental partners now, World Bank, uh, uh, British American Tobacco, uh, GIZ, state government, a lot of partnership. And yes. We're trying to talk with them to say, all right, you know what? Uh -huh. Let us begin to increase our fish production in Nigeria to bridge this gap. I want to tangentially to other species of fish to also help domesticate on commercial level so that people are not just tired of eating catfish and say, yeah. is it catfish alone? Some time ago, the, the federal government said they wanted to ban the importation of farmed fish into Nigeria. They only left with two major options. <laughs> one is popular, which is the catfish. The other one is tilapia. Which is not well, you know, is, is not yeah. well practiced. The culture is yeah. not well practiced. Very few of few few farmers are, are, are practicing uh, the rearing of a tilapia. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, but now in the hub, we're trying to also domesticate a lot of freshwater fish that oh. we can also, you know, encourage others to begin to. Um, produce because the value chain, like I used to say, of agriculture is insatiable, not just aquaculture. Just pick a product, pick, pick an item. The value chain is insatiable. And I keep saying it that agriculture is the only bailout, the only panacea for our unemployment problem in Nigeria is agriculture. Because if we get it right with agriculture, we will get it right with our industries. We need all these materials to run our industries. So we just jumped up the cliff in Nigeria. Huh. We never consolidated our industrial phase. Huh. That's why we are grappling, the way we are grappling. Huh. Yeah, we have read, we've seen about the four, uh, the, 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 uh, the four Asian tigers, huh. Hong Kong, uh, Taiwan, Japan. Japan, uh, China. Japan, join them. Japan, Singapore and um, South South Korea. Mm. Those were the four Asian tigers, and we saw how they how, how they got out of that out of out of that. Look at what they have today. Yeah, they developed their industrial phase, but we are still grappling. I just told you we have used for the six generators mm. in in fifteen years. In the hub, that's on our farm. Us. In the hub, this hub, for four good years, we never connected our, 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 our source of power awesome. to, to, the, to, the, to grid. the national grid. We ran on generator for, for because I've always built power as part of our running costs. So I don't even think about it. It's, it. I don't even see it as a limiting factor anymore. As I built it as part of a going concern that we just have to live with so it's like you wake up every morning sir and you put money inside fire to burn up because once the diesel finishes your money is gone that's what we've been doing boy boy this is wonderful and we have to this keep is, the nation, you know? yeah to keep this the is this is yeah. the dragon <laughs> <laughs> dragon's <laughs> day <laughs> mind oh mind I must really thank you so much, Steve, for this wonderful session. It's been really nice having you on the Mentors Lounge today. I mean, I, I, I have been really inspired and um, I've gained a lot from this interview and I'm sure a lot of people will gain from this, especially people trying to navigate uh, uncharted waters. Yeah. And so my dear people, this is Larry Lewis again, signing off on the Mentors Lounge. This is the third episode till I come your way in December. Keep blazing the trail. And don't forget to share this with as many people as you want them to learn. Because on Mentors Lounge, we want to democratize success. God bless you and bye for now.